Welcome to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. My guest this week is Mr. Neil McCluskey. He's a doctoral candidate and an associate director of the Cato Institute's Center for Educational Freedom. He's also the author of the book, Feds in the Classroom, How Big Government Corrupts, Cripples, and Compromises American Education. His new recent white paper is called, How Much Ivory Does This Tower Need? What We Spend on and Get from Higher Education. Neil McCluskey, welcome to Inside Academia. Hi, thanks for having me on. At uh, Penn State University, uh, you gave a talk about the cost of higher education. And uh, one of the focal points in your talk uh, at Penn State was that uh, the government, by way of uh, backing uh, student loans and now directly giving out student loans, has for years and, and decades contributed largely to the skyrocketing of tuition costs at major universities, not just Penn State, but in many other universities. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and explain that? Sure. So the federal government provides lots of aid to students. Um, the biggest chunk of it is loans, but there are also Pell Grants, and Pell Grants have grown in terms of the maximum size of a grant, especially recently, and the number of people can get those grants. So those also help students to pay more and more uh, for college. And in addition to these things, the federal government in particular, although state governments also have grant programs, things like that, the federal government is the main source of this sort of money, but there are also tax deduction and tax credit programs. So ultimately, what the federal government primarily, but also state governments are doing, is they are having, they are directing more and more money through students to colleges and universities. Now the argument is, well, we have to give these students more money to make college affordable. What's always forgotten or ignored when they do that is colleges can just raise their prices then to capture that aid. And that is very much what's happening. Yes, there are other things that affect whether or not college costs go up. But there's no question when you look at long-term data that colleges and universities, public and private, raise their prices simply because they can. And because they can because largely the federal government makes sure students can always pay those higher prices. Well, university administrators will typically cite uh, decreases in state funding and um, will say that we, we didn't get as much as we needed this year or we didn't get as much as we got last year or we didn't get enough to keep up with... Uh, the rate of inflation or the amount that we needed and say it said we needed. So therefore, that's the reason we got to raise tuition any given year, 2%, 3%, 5%, 6%, 7%. Right. So the first thing you have to realize then is, well, that excludes all private colleges and universities. So they must be raising their prices for some other reasons, most likely because they can, because of all the aid. So it, get rid of that whole chunk of higher education. And then let's focus in on the public colleges and universities. Now, it's true that the uh, allocations from governments to state colleges and universities nationally, and you see it in most states, is kind of uh, goes along with the business cycle. So when there's more revenue coming in, the states give their colleges and universities more money. Um, and it's true that if you look at those years where the allocations on a per pupil basis are going down, that tuition often goes up the price of tuition and the revenue through tuition. But if you look at a long span, say 25 years, which you can find this data at the state higher education executive officers, every year they put out a report on state higher education finance. Well, the tuition prices and revenue goes up when, when states are increasing their per pupil expenditures and when they're decreasing them. In other words, the public colleges are raising their tuition prices no matter what the state is doing, even when they're getting more and more money from the state. And again, that is because they are simply able to do it. And they're able to do it largely because of the federal government, but also because there are some state aid programs enable pupil students to pay more and more. So where, from a policy perspective, I mean, where do we, uh, I mean, who's the, the the main culprit here? I mean, do we have to work towards, with or through government to uh, decrease student aid in order to uh, uh, hold these challenges accountable? 
or, you know, in other words, are the colleges just off the hook because uh, if they can get more money, they will, and, and so we don't blame them. We should only blame the government, or how do we ta tackle this? Because no politician is going to stick his neck out and say, yeah, the solution to the problem of college costs is to, uh, is to cut back on student loans because they, they know that's political death. Yeah, well, so there is no, there's no, no solution other than the one that logically you know has to happen which is that aid has to be reduced. Now, of course, it's true. Politicians are self-interested. And for decades now, they've gotten votes, they've gotten support by being Santa Claus, by saying, well, we're going to keep on giving you more money so you can afford college. But I think now is the time where we can really reach the public, and that's who ultimately politicians respond to. If the public, if voters were to be really outraged over the waste of taxpayer dollars and aid and how it drives up tuition costs, then the politicians would begin to say, it's in my interest to reduce this aid. And I think that, that, that we have this great opportunity now to do that with Occupy Wall Street, we've talked about a higher education bubble, and we're starting to see more people receptive to the idea that, yeah, all this aid the federal government is providing, all these loans, really just help to drive up the costs. And there are a lot of people who are angry because on direct loans, which is what all federal loans are now, they used to be guaranteed loans where you get money from a bank, but it would all be backed by the federal government. But now the federal government does all the lending from the treasury. Mm -hmm. It all comes right from the taxpayers. Well, there's good reason to believe they're actually making a pretty big profit on these. At least they are bringing in more money than the rate that they, of interest they have to pay to get that money. And so people are beginning to get angry for that reason, too, saying, why should the federal government be making money off of students? Right. So now is the time to convince the public, to explain to the public that the student aid, which seems like it should help people pay for college, is self-defeating. It just lets college and universities raise their prices. And so it's not helping the student, and it is killing taxpayers. So That message can get out now. So, so many people would argue then uh – that the institutions are going to become, they're going to go, they're going to revert back to this uh, elitist sort of thing where only the, the sons and daughters of the, the wealthy can afford to go. And even if the price does come down a little bit, uh, still there's going to be a vast swath of people out there who are not going to be able to get the commensurate aid they need to be able to afford college. And we're going to regress. We're going to retrogress to this society that's less educated. And therefore, that's not a public good. And it's rather a public good if everyone goes and becomes supposedly educated, but as you know, they're just largely being credentialed in mass these days rather than truly being enlightened, but that's another story altogether. But nonetheless, what is your thought about the public good versus private good? I mean, it's a combination of both. It clearly is to some degree a public good. Should the government just get out of the business altogether and come what may, or what's, what's your take on that? The first thing is, whenever I hear the public good invoked in, in uh, this discussion, I always want people to really quantify that for me. Tell me, where is this public good? What is it? How much of it do we know we're getting? And rarely have I seen somebody do that. Then the next point is, often you're getting the public good that you're talking about because people are, are, are pursuing their own private interests. So we hear that, well, people who are more educated will tend to vote more. Well, if my intention in getting educated is to get a better job, presumably I'll get whatever it is that enables me to vote more, which is you know, really not something you're getting in college, but it's another story, but I'll be getting that by pursuing my own private interests. And so the argument's always, well, you're not putting in, you're not pricing properly this public part. Well, that's irrelevant. We'll get that just based on my pricing the private gains. But what's much more important is we, we talk about the public good, and then we don't talk about, well, what's this? What's the cost of this public good? Now, taxpayers are on the hook as of 2010 for $268 billion just for that year mm -hmm. in, in loans and grants and things like that. But that's just the beginning of the cost. Then we know that just about half of people at four-year schools aren't going to finish their programs in six years, and most of those people will never finish. We know that about a third of people with bachelor's degrees are in jobs that don't require them. We know that you have massive credential inflation where a job will call for a degree, 
but they don't actually expect that to have any skills or abilities attendant with it. It just means that degree is a proxy for the person who'll show up on time as, you know, probably reasonably intelligent. We have all sorts of data that, oh, at a two-year colleges, only about a fifth of people will finish within three years complete their program. Mm -hmm. So we have this just gargantuan waste, and it's not helping students who are often being pushed to college to waste time and much of their own money and not completing a program. And it is it's terrible for the economy because it's taking money from more productive users, the taxpayers who earn that money, and giving it to college and universities. So the public good argument completely falls apart under even the most basic of scrutiny. That speaks to another issue. I mean, in many ways, it's become a public liability. It's a public detriment rather than a public good to saddle people with so much debt qualify them with, with no skills at all, but credentialize them, thinking and making them think that they're now supposedly qualified for something to get a job, and then there they are without a job. They've lost four to five years, and now they're in this much debt. So in many ways, the aggregate of all of that is a public detriment. Uh, but if, if schools truly did provide um, a, you know, a, a, a meaningful way by which to become gainfully employed for everybody, then the, the aggregate of all those people would, would, in fact, be a public good. But uh, as I interviewed uh, Trevor Gass, he talked about how so many people are getting uh, majors and degrees that will yield them no benefit whatsoever as far as getting a job is concerned. And so maybe job sector allocation is strategically where uh, we ought to be focusing. We are best off when private individuals use their own money to purchase things. In part, that's because they will use the money they earned much more efficiently and wisely than money that's given to them. Mm -hmm. Even more important is when we have massive subsidies, first going to schools and going to students, you no longer have useful price signals, and that is so important. Prices basically tell us the relative value of one thing versus any other thing you can get a price for in the world. So the, the value of a degree versus a, a you know six bananas or something yeah. like that. But when we have all these subsidies, the consumers don't actually know what the cost and price of the things they're consuming are. And in particular, if you want to you know, get narrow down more into higher education, I mean, if the engineering major is charged the same tuition as the English major, that makes absolutely no sense. For one thing, the engineering major is probably going to get a much better job. Right. Um, and that should be reflected in the price. Um, but also it's more costly to train that engineering major than an English major, but we don't have any of that. And then higher education colleges have a tremendous cross-subsidization problem where, you know, they'll be making money in the business school, they'll be losing tons of money in the classics department, and they'll just shuffle money from business school to the classics department so they can continue to run lots of inefficient things. So what is ultimately important is we have to get rid of these distortions. And the fact of the matter is that will not keep poor people from getting the education they need, assuming that the poor people are able to, in some basic way, demonstrate that they can actually do college-level work and use that to get a job. Because then somebody who has money to lend says, I can make a profit by lending money to this person because they have demonstrated aptitude to do college work and then get a good job. And then that student also profits because they're getting the money that enables them to get the education that then enables them to greatly increase their earning. Mm -hmm. So the market will work to ensure that poor qualified people can go to college just as much as anyone else, but we have to let that market operate. I am an advocate of the, of the idea of the classics, uh, not because it's supposed to be a ticket to financial success. It never was intended for that. It was supposed to be a program through which, you know, you, you inherited the, the, the past, Western civilization, you learned virtue and all those things. And there, that's something you can't really put a price tag on. But I agree with you that pub publicly subsidizing everyone to go through it and then they don't even get the benefit of that uh, is not the solution and it's putting everyone into debt. And so that's, um, there's mixed messages in higher education. The, the point of forgiveness was a, a, a recent topic in the news with the Obama administration, Department of Education, announcing that uh, they want to lower the amount of years it takes uh, to, that you would have to pay, uh, try to pay your loans back in after which a forgiveness would be offered. So it's going down from 25 to 20 years. And, um, you know, you, you addressed this point in your talk at Penn State. Uh, it's clearly not fair to the taxpayers. Uh, because any amount of loans that students don't pay back, obviously it gets tacked onto the federal deficit. On the other hand, though, many students, as you know from your own argument, 
if the tuition that they're paying is artificially inflated precisely because of aid that came from the government, either in the form of back loans or direct loans, then those prices that they paid for tuition were artificially inflated to begin with. So technically, those students paid more than they should have because the market would have dictated a lower price. So these people are on the hook for um, amounts that are compounding interest that are far greater than what they ever should have been. Should there be, therefore, some kind of forgiveness in place for students who aren't going to be able to overcome sixty dollars to $70,000 worth of debt, getting a $30,000 a year social worker job, for example? Yeah, so I'm obviously sympathetic to people as they confront college prices because they are clearly inflated, and they are inflated because the aid is built into the price. You are expected to get a large amounts of aid. But that still doesn't justify um, loan forgiveness. One, and this is what's most important, because the people supplying the money, the taxpayers, had no choice in the matter. They didn't get to volunteer to say, I will float this person alone. Uh, two, there still needs to be personal responsibility. Nobody makes students go to school and, and, and uh, acquire huge debts. There are some options to, that are less expensive. You do two years in community college. There are ways right. to to reduce your expenses. The average debt is still only about twenty seven, twenty five to twenty seven thousand uh, dollars for someone who graduates with debt. This is an undergraduate, which is a, it's way too much for the, for what you're getting from college. Mm -hmm. But it is not the incredible burden we're we're led to believe that it's somehow going to destroy your financial life. Uh, for the next you know, 20 to 30 years. Um, but it depends on how, how, how gainfully employed you are. Well, and that's the, that's the next point is people do need to be, need to take responsibility for the choices of the, uh, fields they go into. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're going into something like social work, you need to be looking to see how much that's going to cost you and whether you can pay your debt off. If you're not doing that basic uh, uh, due diligence, yeah. then you have no claim on a taxpayer to say, oh, well, I made this mistake, I can't, sure. you need to eat this. But, uh, you know, and that's the big problem is we, pe the consumers need to be taking responsibility for the decisions that they made, and if we just say, ah, if you're not happy, we'll forgive it, that is even less reason for them to care about how careful they are as consumers. You're absolutely right about that, but you know darn well what's going on. I mean, you've got all these, you've got 18 year olds coming out of high school. They're, they're being told by their guidance counselors, their teachers, their parents, everyone in society, I mean, pol politicians are the same thing. Gotta go to college, gotta go, gotta go. I've interviewed so many young guys and girls that are telling me the exact same thing. Yeah, sometimes they're told, what are you gonna go into, think about that, so on. But for the most part, they tell them, you don't know what you want to study. You don't know what you want to learn. You don't know what you want to do. Don't worry about it. You're going to just go into college. You'll figure it out when you go there. Universities have these uh, undecided major uh, programs where you can just go in, start as amassing gen ed credits, and uh, they'll just, you know, by their second or third year, you can declare a major. That's okay. You'll figure it out as you go along. So <clears throat> the system sort of, if I can come back to that level, is pushing everyone into the colleges because you can't get anything with a high school degree. So once they're there, then only after two to three or four years after they're more than halfway done the program and spent all this money beyond the point of no return, do they wake up and many of them realize, hey, you know what, I should, I should be thinking what I'm doing, where I'm going, how much I'm spending, how, what I'm going to study, what am I going to learn, major in, what degree I'm going to get, and what jobs I'm going to apply for. But they don't begin waking up to any of this, many people, until they're the second half, the last two years perhaps of their, their college tenure. So I think there's a systemic problem in which we can't expect these 18 year, uh, 19 year olds coming out of high school who never m worked uh, to make $30,000 or don't know what it's like to even make that amount of money, just go sign a promissory note and just push them into the colleges. Yeah, well, I think you're, I mean, you're definitely right about that. So I, I still don't think we can just forgive them the, the bad decisions they make, especially because there are innocent people who would suffer, and I call taxpayers. But you're absolutely right that we have a system at the K through 12 level, which is really where all this begins, uh, where we, uh, we at least say rhetorically, everybody should go to college, and then we, we pretty much say, if you don't go to college, you're doomed to be a second-class citizen. You're doomed right. to failure. And if you look in many other countries, they don't have the same system. You get to be in eighth grade or tenth grade, and you can choose. You say, I don't want to be, a, I don't want to go to liberal arts college. I want to become a welder or something like that. And they have tracks where you can easily choose. Hey, I'm going to go do an apprenticeship with a company where I'll get. 
I'll do training, you know, three days of the week. Then I'll be with the company actually working for two days of the week. Lots of options because we know that all kids are, you know, inclined to do different things, suited to do different things, that all kids are different. And there isn't this idea that if you don't go to college that you're worthless. Right. We do have that problem here, and you're absolutely right, that at least rhetorically every politician, presumably most guidance counselors are saying, you, you really have to go to college if you want to be anything. And that's just not true, and you can look at workforce data and see that's not true. Um, the fact that something like 1.5% of high school dropouts earn more than the average person with a professional degree, which is a doctor or a lawyer. Those are the highest paying uh, overall groups mm -hmm. uh, of fields to go in. Um, and th there's lots of other breakdowns where you see that, you know, there are, I can't remember the percentage, 15 or 16 or 17 percent of people with just a high school diploma make more than the average person with a bachelor's degree. There's lots of different ways to break this down where you'll see you can make a lot of money not going to college. Plus, then there's the whole credential inflation problem where it used to be you just had a high school diploma, but now they say, eh, get a college diploma because everybody's got one. We don't really think you have any more skills or ability, but it shows you'll stick with something for four years. So, yeah, it's absolutely true. We've got to start to address this at the K-12 through level where, of course, all the politicians are going to say you have to send everyone to college because if a politician were to say otherwise, they'd be accused of consigning people to second class citizenship. Right. Should there be any kind of public support going to the schools at all? I mean, would your solution be to cut all loans and would it also be then to cut all appropriations? Is there any kind of reconcilability between public support and this private good uh, idea that you're saying is all that we have in, uh, in, in higher education? Right, I think there's very little. So I would say you would want to eliminate all taxpayer-backed student aid. And that would include, it's hard to classify the, the credits and deductions as being taxpayer aid because you're really just letting people keep their own tax money, only they have to use it for something the government wants them to use it for. Um, but anyway, you would eliminate those distortions, uh, and you'd have to eliminate direct appropriations to schools, except in a few specific instances. Um, for instance, if, if the federal government needs research done, and it's done for something that the federal government has constitutional authority to be involved in, the biggest thing, of course, is the military defense, there's no problem with, um, certainly with research grants going to colleges and universities. You could certainly see a, a justification for even establishing some departments that do full-time research-related work. States often, in their legitimate governing uh, responsibilities, do have research they need to have done, and there's nothing wrong with their you know, sending research grants to public colleges and universities. But what has to be important is it's not to sustain the college, it's to get done something the state needs to do. And, and that is important because ultimately you cannot use third-party money you know, taxpayer money without distorting prices and making people less sensitive about the things they buy, less responsive uh, to the people they're supposed to serve. And so, yes, we'd, we'd ultimately have to get rid of all this aid if we want maximum efficiency. Now, uh, people say, well, okay, but low-income people couldn't get loans because of the collateral problem. If they don't have collateral, if they, if they default. Well, maybe you can justify the federal government saying, okay, we'll guarantee this loan in terms of, you know, will represent the collateral. But you do that for only the lowest income of students. Right now, the federal government runs loans. It doesn't matter what your income is. You can qualify for those things. There's no reason the federal government should run programs that every wealthy person can use to cheapen you know, or to pay right. more to go to college, things like that. So there are, there are places to start, and I could see, you know, some agreement on a very basic safety net. Right. But I, I don't even think that would be necessary because somebody with demonstrated aptitude to do college work would then be able to get a good job, would greatly increase their earnings, and a lender would have huge incentive to uh, work with people like that. Your new policy paper uh, for the Cato Institute, how much ivory does this tower need, uh, what we spend on and get from higher education? Okay, Associate Director of Cato's Institute Educational Freedom, Doctoral Candidate Neil McCluskey, I thank you for joining us this week on Inside Academia. Thanks. All right, I'm Andy Nash. This has been InsideAcademia.tv. Please join us again next week as we take you for a look behind the Ivory Curtain.